Hi, everybody. Can uh, people hear me, Sierra? Can you can you hear me? Yes, Tom, we can hear you. Great, thank you. I just like to make sure before I start uh, going off if <laughs> there's a problem. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Chapter 1 uh, Statistic Solutions webinar. Um, we have a co-host on, Sierra, who is now in the chat box. Um, putting links uh, up where you can find this uh, webinar. If you want to look at it later, uh, it's on our website. We archive it along with um, other webinars. Um, there's other links there to schedule a consultation uh, later if you want to do that. Um, she can also answer any questions you have that aren't related to content, you know, any kind of technical questions that you might have. OK, so uh, before we get started, um, if you have any questions as we go on, um, that's fine. You can type them in the question and answer box um, so you don't forget them. Um, just um, I won't get to them until the end. At the end, we'll have like a, a question and answer session. OK, great. So let's get started here. Um, chapter one. Uh, here's what we're going to be covering, the content. Uh, today's webinar, but just to kind of pull back for a minute, um, the chapter one is the introduction to the study. Typically, um, what we go by is um, what is pretty standard um, in social sciences um, for dissertation structure uh, is the five chapter model. Um, there are differences to that. Um, Sometimes the content is, is chopped up a little differently, but this is pretty typical of the, the five chapter model um, where chapter one is the introduction, uh, chapter two is the literature review, chapter three is the methodology, chapter four is the results, and chapter five is the discussion of your results. And like I said, sometimes um, you know, schools will have a chapter six, but usually something like that is, means like the chapter five has been split. Um, so the content is usually the same. Sometimes the structure may be a little different. So having said that, it's always uh, fundamental, important um, that you get your school's template for the dissertation um, and follow it. Right, because um, while there are a lot of commonalities, um, you know, in the chapter structures and the content, um, like this is a pretty representative um, example of content, typically of the chapter one. Um, there, you know, there are different schools do have differences. They, you know, sometimes the header headers might be in different orders. Um, they may call for something a little different. Um, so always get your school's template, always follow that. I mean, that, that, that's just like rule number one. Um, having said that, this will be a good guide though, um, to what typically in there. Okay. Um, so yeah, chapter one is the introduction to the, think of it like the blueprint of the study, right? It's going to answer, um, three big fundamental questions, which is your topic. What are you doing? Um, why are you doing it? The research problem and how, uh, which is your methods. Um, now your methods um, may be probably in chapter one are um, not incredibly detailed and worked out. It's just kind of a preview of what you're going to be doing. Um, but the methods chapter is where you really kind of get involved in the methods and get in you know, very detailed. But um, it's, you know, like I said, it's a, it's kind of a blueprint. It's an introduction, what you're going to do, why you're going to do it and how. Um, so let's look at the, uh, the individual sections. Usually the introduction chapter itself has an introduction section. Um, and the introduction section is usually not that long um, because things will be worked out more in the chapter as you go along, but it, it does what it says it does. It's going to introduce the reader to what you're going to be doing and why. Um, so you want to introduce the social organizational problem because usually there is some kind of um, social 
organizational problem, you know, it could be an education, you know, whatever it is, uh, drive that drives your study or drives the need for your study. Introduce that. Use statistics um, to get your reader's attention, to show the prevalence or to show the degree of the problem. Um, or, or some kind of um, peer-reviewed source that that indicates that it's it's a problem, um, you know, and the, the kind of severity of it. Uh, if you use statistics, um, you know, let's just throw out an example. Let's say, um, like the attrition rate of special education teachers, right? Um, if you're going to, that's your organizational problem. Um, you know, use some statistics to back that up. Um, to, sh to show that it's a problem. Do you want to use statistics from 10 years ago, 15 years ago? No, of course not. Um, you want to show that the problem exists currently, right? So um, your, your statistics, um, even if it's a peer-reviewed source and observation from another researcher, um, you want it to be as recent as possible, right? Um, and you want to keep that focus throughout the entire chapter, ideally, um, because what may have been a problem 10, 15, 20 years ago may not be a problem anymore, or the problem may have shifted or changed, right? So we want a current understanding of what's going on, not, not what happened you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, also introduce the research problem. And this is what's gonna drive the study. Um, so we have the organizational and the social problem, um, attrition of special education teachers, but there's also gonna be research on that, right? It's not like it's never been researched. So you want to introduce, and again, this is something you're gonna flesh out later in the chapter, um, what, what we kind of, what we don't know about it. Right. What we there's going to be a lot of research on the attrition of special education teachers. Introduce your research problem. What is the issue or the gap in the research? Why is your study needed? All right. So you want to get that in the introduction too. Uh, oops. Um, state what is needed to address the research problem. In, in other words, how is your study going to be designed to address this problem? Um, and you can end this chapter with, um, you know, previews. I mean, sorry, you can end this section with previews of the chapter, right? Previews of sections of the chapter, what, what it's going to contain. Um, and so the introduction, um, because you're not getting into detail at this point, you just kind of broad strokes. Here's the problem. Um, Here's the research problem here. My study is, the, is designed to address this. Um, you know, probably no more than a couple of pages. Uh, you know, maybe a page, page and a half, two pages at the most. Um, again, follow your template, but I think that's pretty standard because, um, again, in the introduction, it's just to kind of orient your reader, to introduce your reader to what you're going to be doing and why. Um, the details come later. Okay, so the next section is typically the background. Um, and this is different than the introduction, right? The introduction introduces the reader to it. This, this is gonna catch the reader up on the issue on, and the research on the issue. This is kind of broad strokes too, but um, you're gonna kind of tell a little story. And it, when, it, when I mean story, and I say story, I don't mean you know fictional story. I mean um, kind of a narrative of, where the issue has been, where it started, where it's been, where it is now, what is the research? Uh, where's the research been? What research has been conducted on the topic? Uh, what do we know from the research? What don't we know from the research? And what don't we know from the research should be kind of funneling toward what you're gonna be doing and why, right? Um, the research gap or the research problem. So, the, what I typically find uh, working with, with folks is that um, people usually do a good job of setting up the background of the social or organizational problem, right? Like um, attrition of, of special education teachers. That's part of the background. The other part of the background is the research on it. So it's not just a background on the, the topic or, the, or the, the issue. It's also a background on the research that's been conducted on it. Right. Um, 
because a lot of these topics, there's there's quite a bit of research. So you kind of need to summarize that. You know, you kind of need to give a, a kind of a chronological accounting of the trends in the research. What are researchers focused on? What are some of the, the major areas of research? What have they found? What are some of the important findings? Um, and then you should be, you know, have an eye too towards, well, here's what we know, but also here's what we don't know. Here's the things that haven't been addressed. Here's the questions that haven't been asked. Um, and that's really designed to, again, funnel down and target, you know, the research problem or the research gap um, and why your study is needed. Okay, uh, which again kind of goes to or funnels into the research problem. Um, we need to kind of stop here and just kind of pause and, and kind of talk about what the research problem is um, before we kind of get to the, what's in the section. Uh, because it's, some people will think they, you know, they, they understand it or they, they kind of, they have an idea of it in their mind, but then when they go to kind of like really think about it and put words on the paper, it's it's a little more difficult to um, to do that or to define it. Uh, so the research problem is it's exactly what it sounds. It's a problem or issue in the research, right? Now the problem or issue in the research can be a gap, right? A gap is um, a kind of research problem. It's not the only kind, but it's um, it's a common problem in um, the research. So a gap in understanding, a gap in knowledge. Um, you know, we have, uh, we know all these things, but there's still, there's still things that we don't know. There's still information that we don't have. So we'll research, you know, a gap in the research. That's one type of um, research problem. Other kinds of research problems include, um, maybe we have a lot of one kind of approach or one kind of research to the topic, um, but we don't have much of another kind. Say it, uh, we have a lot of qualitative research on a topic, but we don't have much quantitative. We don't have much um, you know, confirmation of the relationship between um, constructs or it's the reverse. So we have a lot of statistical data on a topic, but we don't have a really in-depth data you know, exploratory qualitative data kind of digging in and, and getting in depth information. So that could be a research problem too. Or certain theories have been used and other theories have not been used um, that they shed, you know, different kind of light on the topic. So those are kind of just quick examples of research problems. Um, if your research problem is a gap, right? A gap in understanding, a uh, gap in knowledge, that's fine, um, but you have to illustrate that to the reader. And that's a little challenging sometimes because if you think about the definition of a gap, um, that's the absence of something, right? By definition. So how do you discuss the absence of something? Um, and what I see people do sometimes is say, yeah, there's no research in this area. There's a gap. We need research in this area. Okay. Um, you know, the, the reader can't just take that at face value, right? You need to illustrate that to them. And plus that wouldn't be much of a research problem section if you had like one sentence saying that. Um, and so the challenge then becomes, how do you describe the absence of something? <laughs> um, so here's the way I like to think about it. Um, it's helpful as if you think of a donut, you know, donut, you have the, the, the donut part and then the hole in the center, right? And that's the gap if you think about that, you know, as a metaphor. Well, how do you def describe the hole or the gap? Well, you describe what's around it and in describing what's around it, you highlight the absence or the gap. So, um, what does that mean for the research problem? If, if it's a gap, you, you describe the research that's been done on the topic, right? As close to what you're doing as you can get, you know, so-and-so did this, uh, somebody else, you know, did research on this and, and, and found what they found. Um, so you, in that way, you kind of um, frame um, the absence or the gap, right? And by, and by saying, but we don't have 
research or we don't have information about you know what it is you're studying or just a gap um so if that helps you think about um kind of you know framing the um the research problem uh if it's if it happens to be a gap in knowledge um and if it's not a gap in knowledge um, it's a similar kind of approach right um so the research problem transitions from the background we're kind of funneling down to 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 what your issue is um so it's a more targeted overview of research on the topic to highlight the research problem so where you kind of um we're using broad strokes above in the background you're getting a little more targeted what research do we have you know recent relevant research on the topic okay you want to you want to summarize that um and then and then that highlights what we don't know or what we need to know or the information that's that's still needed um and you want to specifically state what the research problem is um and specifically state that your study is designed to address that and I just want to pause here for a second to, to make another recommendation. Um, you know, attend webinars, use your resources, use your school's resources, you know, talk to your chair. You're using your resources you can to help you, you know, through the chapter, through the dissertation in general. But it's always a great resource. It's a great help um, to either get it on your own or from your chair is an example or two of dissert approved dissertations from your school um, that are close to what you're doing. Um, that way, when you when you actually you know see what people have done for some of these sections, it will give you a better idea of what what you sh should do. Um, again, you know, use your resources, but sometimes when you're sitting down to write, um, there's just there's sometimes there's no better. Um, resource than a helpful you know an example okay um the purpose uh the purpose section is also not long um and the purpose statement itself is a one sentence statement that encapsulates your study so there's very specific wording about the purpose statement okay um and i have it here and it usually goes like this. The purpose of this approach, then design study is to examine, explore, whatever verb uh, you want, um, the variables or concepts in sample setting, right? So it's kind of a fill in the blank um, statement. And I have some um, examples here. One one's from a quantitative, uh, would be a quantitative example, and another one is a qualitative example. So let's look at it. The purpose of this quantitative, that's your approach, correlational, that's your design, study is to examine. The verbs aren't so important, um, only in the sense that um, explore, something like explore is usually associated with qualitative research um, because usually it is it's kind of exploratory um, so for, for quantitative something like examine investigate um, those are those are fine verbs uh, the relationship this is between transformational leadership and emotional intelligence those are your, your variables um, and in whatever your sample um, you know, middle level managers um, in, in you know, whatever your setting is. Okay, so very specific construction uh, for the purpose statement. Okay, and that will, that's the first sentence of your purpose section. Um, the rest of the section may also include um, information about variables or more information about your concepts, or may even uh, mention the instruments that you're gonna use to measure the, um, variables if it's quantitative so you know check your um check your template again of course uh but the section is usually not long a paragraph um but that purpose statement has a very specific wording to it um the other thing about the um purpose statement just the statement itself not the section um is anytime that you need to mention your purpose throughout the study it should not change you should um, copy and paste verbatim. Now, there's only two cases where you can do that, your research questions and your purpose statement, right? So whenever you mention your research questions throughout the study, whenever you mention your purpose statement throughout the study, those should not change, okay? Um, don't 
change them because you, you don't want things to sound repetitious. Those things stay the same. Um, and those are the only times you get a pass on that. Um, you don't want to copy and paste um, sections or material other than those two things um, from one place in your document to another. Professors frown on that. Okay, so that's the purpose. Um, the research questions typically come next. Again, see what your template says. Um, this is not a, a methods um, webinar, so I'm not going to talk about developing research questions. Um, we do have webinars on you know methods uh, which deal with um, developing research questions. So I'm not going to cover that. Um, if you if you are interested in that, check our schedule to see what we offer as far as methodology and research questions as far as designing them. Um, let's see. The theoretical framework usually comes next. Um, what is the theoretical framework? Really, it's just it's just kind of it's the theories or the major concepts that guide your study and that are going to help explain your results. Um, another big question is sometimes you'll see on your template theoretical or conceptual framework. Um, a <clears throat> big question people have is what's the difference? Which one should I use? Excuse me. I just take a real practical approach to it, um, which is theoretical frameworks are typically associated with quantitative studies. Conceptual frameworks are typically associated with qualitative studies. Okay. Um, so, what does that mean moving forward let's, for the section? Uh, let's just take the theoretical framework first. And most of this will apply to the conceptual framework too. Um, the first thing you want to do is just come out with a, it's a simple declarative statement that will say what theory you will be using. So let's, let's just take the example of what I had in the purpose, which is um, the purpose of this quantitative, whoops, Correlational study is to examine the relationship between transformational leadership and emotional intelligence. So let's just say we're studying that for our theoretical framework. <clears throat> Your theories then would be, you need a theory of transformational leadership, you need a theory of emotional intelligence. So, you know, the first sentence should be just a simple declarative statement, something like, Transformation leadership theory and emotional intelligence the theory of emotional intelligence will serve as a theoretical framework for this study. Um, you have sources for that, right? You want to then define. You can obviously, if you hit, need to use two theories, um, define them separately, right? Have you know paragraph or a subsection on one and then a subsection on another. Um, you want to define the theory. Right. Um, define any components that it has that relate to your study. Um, so for emotional intelligence, it, I think it, I believe it does have components. Um, if those are relating to what you're doing or what you're measuring, you want to define those components as well as the overall theory. Um, obviously, you want to use sources for this, and, and we'll get um, we'll get to what you should be using in a minute. You want to talk about who developed the theory, um, right? and what they've developed it for. I mean, theories are, theories explain things. That's what theories do. So you want to talk a little bit about um, who developed it and what they developed it to explain. Um, talk a little bit about what researchers have used it for, what researchers in the field, your field have used it for. Um, and then you wanna talk a little bit about how it connects to your study, right? Um, So if you're doing a quantitative study, your theoretical framework, let's say it has, it involves emotional intelligence, it involves transformational leadership to continue with our example. So emotional intelligence, okay. Um, you're gonna be using sources to define emotional intelligence, to define the components, who developed it. Um, this is, the theoretical framework is, is kind of related to your, your instrument right, in a quantitative study. So if you're using 
and say there's there's several instruments to measure emotional intelligence. Um, you want to use the theory of emotional intelligence for your study um, that's connected to your instrument. All right. So in other words, these instruments have theoretical foundations, right? They come from something, they come from theories, they come from research, they're, they're not based on you know, nothing. Um, so the instruments have theoretical foundations. So you want to use, if you're using say Goleman, Goleman uh, is a major theorist of emotional intelligence. Um, if you're using Goleman's instrument, right? You're then going to want to use Goleman's definition of emotional intelligence and his kind of research for your for your theoretical framework, right? Because his his theory of emotional intelligence may differ slightly than um, someone else's who has their own instrument. You see what I'm saying? So usually the theories and the instruments match. Um, so you want to use a theorist. Um, for your theoretical framework and for your, your definition of emotional intelligence um, that is associated with the instrument. All right, we get that. So in other words, you don't want to use Goldman's instrument, but use somebody else's theory of emotional intelligence. Okay, because there will be differences and you won't be measuring your framework won't align exactly with what, what you're measuring. Okay, same goes for the other um, section of the, if you need two theories, in this case, one for emotional intelligence and one for uh, transformational leadership. Do the same thing for transformational leadership, right? Um, and together, those two theories, um, they comprise your theoretical framework, okay? Okay. Um, the other thing is just use as many theories as you need. If you can get away with one well-suited theory, perfect. In this case, you need two, right? One for the, the two variables you're studying, um, emotional intelligence um, and transformational leadership. That's fine. If you need two, you need two. Um, you discuss each one and, and then both of them uh, comprise your theoretical framework. But my point is to keep it streamlined. Right and not not so sim and simple, but not simple um, in in kind of a slim, simplistic way, but a streamlined way. Right, um, you don't need extra theories. Extra theories just complicates things. Uh, if you start throwing in other theories, sometimes people think they need theories. I don't know why, because maybe it makes things seem more important. Um, so they'll, they'll be talking about you know three, four, five theories. Um, it confuses your reader, it confuses your chair and your committee. Um, you're going to have to explain all those theories. You're going to have to explain how they connect to your study. Uh, it gets confusing. So it should be streamlined, just what you need for your study, right? And it should be based on what you're studying. Really the same kind of steps apply for the conceptual framework. Um, it's just the major difference is that you may not have kind of a full-blown theory. Um, because you're, you're kind of, you know, your work is kind of more exploratory. Um, so you may just need like a concept um, that, you know, major concept that aligns with what you're studying um, from the literature to kind of base um, your framework on instead of, like I said, instead of a theory. But the kind of steps that I outline are, are pretty much the same for the, the conceptual framework. And again, another section that's really helpful to look at examples. Uh, nature of the study or study design is sometimes next. Um, again, this is in a methods webinar, so I'm not going to go into detail about it. Um, but usually this is where you supply like the rationale for the selection of your design. You know, why did you select a correlational design? Um, you want to summarize the methodology. Uh, sometimes this includes um, from whom and how data will be collected uh, and will be analyzed. Uh, again, if you're more interested in, in, in this type of thing and digging deeper into it, um, we do offer methodological webinars. Okay. And again, this is just for chapter one, so it's, it's going to be a, a more... Um, it's not going to be as in depth of a treatment that you're going to give in chapter three. 
which is all about um, the methods. All right, definitions. Usually there's a section somewhere, um, and usually it's in section one, um, definitions um, where you're defining your variables, you know, your constructs, your, your, your major factors or major concepts um, in your study. A couple of things here. Um, usually, again, check your template, but usually there's no, other than the definitions themselves, the only setup or other text you have in this section is the following terms are defined for use in the study. I mean, really, that's all you need. And then um, go into your, your definitions. Um, definitions should be sequenced alphabetically. Um, so don't just put them in there randomly. Um, you don't need like methods. Sometimes I see folks put methods um, definitions in here, like they'll define correlational. You don't need that. All that stuff comes in your methods section. These are like um, like your variables. To go back to our example, it would be transformational leadership. It would be emotional intelligence. Um, any kind of variable or factor, if it's qualitative, major concepts, um, you know, to attrition in special education teachers, again, special education, special education teacher, attrition. Um, so anything like that, you're, you're going to want to add as a definition. Um, definition should be in the form of sentences. Um, this one's not so important. I've seen, you know, sometimes fragments are used. Um, I just err on the side of caution and just use full sentences. Um, because at some point, somebody may ask you to go back and change into full sentences. Um, definition should be clear and succinct. Um, remember, these are definitions. They're not discussions. So, you know, sometimes I see folks saying, well, there are, there's no consensus on the definition of emotional intelligence. So-and-so says emotional intelligence is this, but somebody else says it's this. No, the definition Again, they're, they're definitions of the term of how you're going to be using them in your study, right? They're not discussions. So usually simple constructions for the sentences, I like to start off something like emotional intelligence refers to, or emotional intelligence is, and just offer a, a definition with um, a peer-reviewed source uh, to support it. I mean, and that's really what your definitions are. One sentence, maybe two, um, concise definitions supported with a peer reviewed source from the literature. That's it. Um, <clears throat> no dictionary definitions under any circumstances because these are not general definitions. These are terms specific to the literature um, being defined as you're going to use it in your study. Um, sources should be recent when possible. The sources that, that back up your um, definitions. Yes, but it's not so important. I mean, sometimes these things come from theories and theories take a long time to develop so they can be older. Um, recent sources here are not so important, but in certain sections like your research problem section, you definitely want recent, recent research for that. Okay, significance. Um, this is <clears throat> a section that professors like to call the so what section. So you're doing a study on emotional intelligence. So what? Um, and by that, they mean, why is it important? Just because we don't have knowledge in some area doesn't automatically make it valuable to have that knowledge. So like, let's say your, your, um, your research problem is based on a gap in knowledge. Hey, we don't have knowledge on this. OK. Um, it could be important that we don't, or, or it might not be. So <clears throat> the significant section is where you discuss the value, basically the value of your research. Who is it going to be valued, valuable to? Um, how is it going to contribute to the literature? What will it tell us? Um, and usually it's just, it's, it's good to conceptualize this um, section as having two prongs, really. Um, how will my research contribute to research? or to the literature, right? What is it going to, what is it going to tell us about the topic that we don't already know in the research? Or how is it going to modify our understanding of the topic? 
you know, how it's going to be valuable to research and to researchers. That's one prong. The other prong is practice. Um, what is the information from my study? Um, how can it inform what people do at the level of practice in my field? Right? How can it, um, you know, how can it be even, you know, maybe distributed to practitioners in my field? Um, you know, so you can kind of get nuts and bolts here. <clears throat> you know, if it's an education study, your um, information might be um, valuable to teachers, right? If it involves practice, um, if it involves policies or something, it might be um, important to administrators. Um, if it involves kind of parental support or something like that, it might be uh, important to parents, right, of, of students. So, you know, think about, um, you know, the level of practice. You can also get nuts and bolts, like I said, in the sense of, um, you know, it might, your, your findings might inform professional developments, and, uh, you know, seminars or, um, you know, kind of seminars that, that, um, that help teachers, you know, learn how to teach, things like that. <clears throat> okay, so that's a significant section. And I think uh, one school, I think Walden, um, has a third kind of prong to this, uh, what they call um, a positive social change. So they, they like a little bit about um, how might your, your study lead to positive social change. And in that case, it's, um, you know, if it improves people's lives, if it, if it helps maybe students get better grades uh, or leads to information that, that would do that or, you know, lead to information um, do people have better well-being somehow? I mean, usually those are kind of tie-ins to positive social change. Okay, other sections, I've kind of lumped these together because some schools have them, some schools don't. Some schools have variations or, or have some of them, but not others. Uh, <clears throat> at some place, usually, usually chapter one and or chapter three, you have to talk about potential limitations to your study. Um, you won't know until you, obviously, until you start conducting the study, but <clears throat> or collecting data. But you're asked to kind of forecast or foresee what what might be weaknesses or shortcomings of your study. Um, sometimes you can't, you know. Maybe it's a difficult population, uh, you know, an at-risk population. So, you know, <clears throat> limitation might always be that you you, you might not get access to, to them. Um, so you would need to think about a proxy, um, you know, pop sample population. Um, Other limitations, um, I mean, I, I don't know how much we're still dealing with COVID restrictions. I mean, at one point that was, you know, potential limitation, especially like face-to-face -face interviewing. Um, but obviously there's other ways to get around that. You can, you can do, um, you know, Zoom interviews, things like that, phone interviews. Um, but anything that um, a major limitation for quantitative research is always going to be a potential low sample size because that that reduces the statistical certainty uh, of your findings. <clears throat> so that could be a potential limitation in, in quantitative studies. Assumptions, and, I, and again, these are these are sections helpful to look at an example to see how people have um, handled these. They're not long either. They're just a little tricky. They're not long. You know, maybe a paragraph, a couple paragraphs for each. Um, assumptions. These are. These are things, aspects of the study that you have to take for granted because you don't have control over them. And one of the biggies is um, you don't have control over participants or how they're going to answer. So you have to assume that after you assure them of anonymity, after you assure them of conf confidentiality of their, their answers, you have to assume that they're going to answer you honestly, right, and to the best of their ability. That's one major assumption. Um, scope, this is sometimes I see it um, referred to as delimitations. These are, I don't want to say limitations, these are kind of the boundaries you put on your study, that you put on your study, right? Uh, and it's going to sound a lot like your, um, you know, your sample, your participants, your setting. Uh, it's the things that you're looking at. What does your study include? What does it exclude? 
but sometimes it's helpful in say education study where you're only going to be looking at parents or talking to parents about their support you're not talking to teachers you're not talking to students you're not talking to administrators just parents so it's it's really again it sounds a lot like you're um you know restating your your sample restating your setting restating your participants um kind of what you're including right in that scope um, again, the, the kind of limitations, the be or better word, boundaries that you put on your own study. All right, and the summary uh, is the last thing, and um, you know, like any other summary, um, anywhere, um, recap the major points of the chapter. Um, also, remind the reader of the research problem, why your study is important, why it's needed, uh, and if you want, you can end by transitioning to the next chapter. Um, again, always check your templates, see if they want something different or something else, but that's that's a good general rule of thumb right there. Um, and let's see, this is who we are, some of our contact information. Uh, obviously, in the chat box, you have other contact information. Um, so if you, you know, you think you, want to know more about what we do, I mean, feel free to contact us. Um, it's a free consult uh, just to see if what we offer is is right for you. Okay. I'm going to leave that up and I'm going to open the, the floor to questions. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them about chapter one or anything in chapter one. You can go ahead and use the, the question and answer box if you want. All right, no questions. Everybody's good uh, with the chapter one. Uh, just one, one more thing. Sometimes I get asked about um, page links for chapters. Um, you know, again, your your template may have may have some recommendations on that or requirements. Um, but I would say chapter one is probably the sweet spot. You know, between between 10 to 20 pages, with a sweet spot being about 15, 12 to 15 pages, um, 10 to 15, something like that. Um, I've seen them up to 20. Uh, there's really no, I don't see reason to go past 20. Um, that seems like a lot to me. So I'd say 15 to 12 is probably about right. Maybe 10, even as low as 10. Just depends on how concise you are. No questions? All right. Well, if there's no questions, I'm going to wish you a good rest of your day. And um, remember, we do. You're welcome. We, we do um, offer other webinars on other topics and other chapters. So, um, when you're ready for those, I mean, uh, take a look, see what we offer and, and sign up for those if you think those would help. All right, great, everybody. Thank you. All right, take care.